series on profiles of the performers in honor of the demi millennial celebration of the Reformation. So, one uh, sultry July day in the year 1505, a young student was trudging over a parched road on the outskirts of the Saxon village of Stoderheim. Ominously, the sky clouded over, becoming completely dark. Then suddenly, a bolt of lightning pierced the gloom, knocking the young man to the ground. In terror, he cried out, St. Anne, save me, and I will become a monk. Well, it was not just the terror of the moment which had extracted the oath from the young Martin Luther, but concern for his salvation. For it was commonly believed in that day that the only way to really play it safe with salvation was to become a monk. To entering monks, the assurance was given, keep this rule and I promise you eternal life. Thus, it was his quest for spiritual security which drove Luther to take the cow. But his father had concern for another sort of security, material. And Luther's sudden vocational ambition verged from the parental plans carefully laid for the prized son. Here are his parents. In colloquial, actually, Hansel and Gretel, would you believe? That's the way it is. Margarita and, and Han, Johannes and Margarita, Hansel and Gretel, okay? Luther's parents, so you learned something. Um, Hans and Margarita recognized in young Martin's brilliant ability and intended that he should become a lawyer, surprise, surprise, and so support them in their old age. As a graduation gift, Hans presented his son Martin with the needed text, the Corpus Juris Civilis. They sought to persuade him to reconsider, appealing to scripture itself to sway him. You learned scholar, have you never read the Bible that you should honor your father and mother? And here you have left me and your dear mother to look after ourselves in old age. But Martin would not be shaken. Salvation was at stake. And if the cowl alone would safely secure it, then the cowl it would be. So Luther exchanged his civilian clothes for his Augustinian habit as the prior of the monastery intoned, Bless thou thy servant, whom we have clad in the habit of a monk, that he may merit eternal life. It's significant that the great revolt against the Church of Rome arose from a desperate attempt to follow the very way of salvation that she prescribed. Luther set himself to the system of salvation with all the vigor he possessed. He offered good works to God to accrue merit prayers, vigils, mortifications, whatever good works a man might do to save himself, Luther performed. And he rendered satisfaction by penance for all of his shortcomings. In hindsight, he testified, if any could have been saved by his monkery, it was I. What drove Luther was his terror of a holy God. For he felt acutely that wrath must be the face of justice for the sinner. When it is touched by this passing inundation of the eternal, he reflected somberly, the soul feels and drinks nothing but eternal punishment. Terrifying. There's the soul, the little soul, that is being weighed in the judgment. 
Notice the little demon trying to make the other side <laughs> go, go down. So great was his terror to stand in the presence of an infinitely holy God. The novice monk well nigh passed out when he offered his first mass. With trembling voice, he uttered the invocation. We offer unto thee the living, the true, eternal God. At these words, I was utterly stupefied and terror-stricken. I thought to myself, with what tongue shall I address such majesty? Desperately, he sought to clear himself in confession ever worried that he may have neglected some sin, he not infrequently would sit in the confessional six hours. His confessor, Staupitz, thought his parading of peccadilloes overscrupulous. Why don't you commit some serious sin, like parricide, blasphemy, or adultery? But all sin, small as well as great, must be purged. Luther's satisfactions often brought him to death's door. He would regularly cast off his blankets in the winter in an act of penance and mortification and so nearly froze to death. And when an opportunity presented itself for Luther to visit Rome, he jumped at the chance. It was not architecture nor, archi uh, nor art which lured him. Rather, it was the prospect of gaining additional merit by viewing all the relics with which the eternal city was brimming. Indeed, Rome was the greatest treasury of merit in all Christendom. From the chain that bound St. Peter to the coin paid to Judas, it was a supermarket of spare merit. And Luther intended to do all the rounds assiduously. This was all the different places. This is a little pilgrim's guide. All the places you should go to get merit. Before the Lateran were the Scala Sancta, 28 stairs, which had stood in front of Pilate's palace, miraculously transported to Rome. Whoever crawled up them on hands and knees and repeated a paternoster and our father for each one could thereby release a soul from purgatory. Luther made his prostrate ascent, kissing each step for good measure. Enthusiastic tradition has it that at the top, Luther uttered in a flash of spiritual insight, the just shall live by faith. This truth had not yet crystallized for him. It's also commonly read that at the summit, Luther muttered, who knows whether this is so? But it seems that even growing doubts did not yet plague this zealous monk. I believed every filthy lie they told me. I was so drunk, so submerged in the Pope's dogmas Luther later testified, I ran around Rome like a mad saint. But for all of his efforts to earn God's favor, Luther found no peace. And the terror of judgment of a holy God hung over him like the thundercloud of Stoderheim. <clears throat> Returning from Rome, Luther transferred monasteries, moving from Erfurt to Wittenberg, uh, Wittenberg uh, Wittenberg was a smaller backwater town of some 2,000 at the time. Most Wittenbergers earned their living by brewing a heavy beer, uh, much of which they probably drank themselves. In fact, Luther himself would uh, be proud of his capacity. He had an enormous stein, an enormous mug with three markers on it. The Ten Commandments at the top, then the Lord's Prayer in the middle, and then the Apostles' Creed on the bottom, and he boasted that he could drain his flagon 
all the way to the Apostles' Creed in one goal. That's a theologian fighting. <laughs> He's got me on that one for sure. There, Luther poured over theological tomes in search of salvation. But the current theology simply told him to do his best to earn God's favor and hope that God's grace would make up the difference. As the theology books of his day expressed it, do what is within you. God will not refuse grace to those who do what is within them. But what was enough? How would you know that your efforts were sufficient? Luther's restlessness remained. The system of salvation Rome offered was not working for him. I hoped I might find peace of conscience with fasts, prayers, and vigils with which I miserably afflicted my body. But the more I sweated it out like this, the less peace and tranquility I knew. Then a pivotal incident occurred. Sitting under the pear tree, that pear tree would always be precious to him, in the monastery courtyard, Staupitz, Luther's superior, directed him to take up the study of the Bible. I copied this image from my father's study. This sat above his desk. Uh, <clears throat> There he is studying his Bible. As odd as it may seem, uh, this was a rather rare occupation for monks of his day and far from the staple of a theological education. Luther set himself to the task with vigor. At uh, 28 years old, he received his doctorate and became professor of sacred scriptures. And he would spend the rest of his life teaching the Bible. And it was in wrestling to understand the text that his eyes were opened to the gospel. In the last year of his life, he reflected back upon this great event. I'm going to quote at length. It's worth getting. He writes, I was seized with great earnestness to understand Paul in his epistle to the Romans. One term stood in my way, the justice of God. He was reading Romans 1.17. The justice of God. I hated this word justice. For I had been taught to understand it as the active justice of God, whereby a just God punishes unjust sinners. However irreproachable my life as a monk, I felt myself in the presence of God to be a sinner with a most unquiet conscience. Nor could I believe him pleased with my many satisfactions. I did not love God. Indeed, I hated this just God who punishes sin. But I raged with fierce and disturbed conscience in this way. And yet I knocked with importunity at Paul in this place with a burning desire to know what St. Paul could intend. At last, God being merciful, as I meditated day and night, pondering the connection of the words, the justice of God is revealed, and the just shall live by faith, I began to understand the justice of God passively, whereby God justifies us by faith. At this, I felt myself to be born anew and to enter through open gates into paradise itself. From here, the whole face of the scriptures was altered to me. This passage from Paul 
became to me the gate of heaven. What was it that Luther came to understand in this text of the Apostle Paul that brought him from torment and terror to peace and paradise? That the righteousness of God, that phrase there in Romans, that the righteousness of God does not simply refer to God's character, but also to his gift. That is, this righteousness of God should be understood as a righteousness from God. As the Apostle Paul puts it elsewhere, a righteousness that comes from God, as in Philippians 3.9. We do not have the required righteousness ourselves, and we'll never muster it ourselves, but Jesus does have it. And by trusting him <coughs> as Savior, his righteousness is counted as ours. Here it is. A little chart. So our only standing and acceptableness, our only righteousness before a holy God is the one that he, that God himself provides. the contrast. What he had been taught, what he came to grasp. We do not achieve it, we receive it. It is not a personal righteousness, our own. It is an alien righteousness, that of another, Jesus the righteous. It does not reflect our performance, but Christ's. It is not our moral ledger, but his. <clears throat> Luther had grasped from Scripture that our righteousness is entirely and exclusively by grace. That is, it comes as God's unmerited gift. Salvation is, as he came to call it, sola gratia exclusively by grace. Luther's new understanding of the gospel was like a, a pinch of yeast that gradually worked its way through all of his thinking. In the spring of 1518, Luther was invited to defend his theology before a large and learned and public meeting at Heidelberg. Luther was to present and defend theses and they articulated this newly grasped sola gratia gospel. The very first thesis could easily have been autobiographical. It stated, the law of God is not able to bring a man to righteousness, but rather stands in the way. Another, God does not find but rather creates what is pleasing in us. Rather than seeking good, he bestows it. He concluded with this declaration. The law says, do this, and it is never done. Grace says, believe in this man, and immediately everything is done. Well, it was the gospel that was heard that day in Heidelberg. Justly may it be said that under God, the cause of the Great Reformation was a Bible student's insight into the meaning of Scripture. What a great motivation for us to be studying our Bibles with all diligence. While the issue of the gospel, how a sinner becomes acceptable before God, was the most important issue of the Reformation. A different one thrust Luther into celebrity. 
the indulgence controversy. This is a copy of an, an, an indulgence. I'll explain that in a little bit. Um, Albert of Brandenburg, uh, there he is, a boy um, too young to legitimately occupy a bishop's chair, was, notwithstanding, already bishop of both Magdeburg and Halberstadt. But Albert further coveted the archbishopric of Mainz, which would have made him primate of all Germany. This, however, would have been in such horrendous violation of Roman church law that the current pope, Leo X, said it would cost Albert a pretty penny to make an exception. <laughs> Albert knew that money would talk, for Pope Leo needed funds to support his habit of hunting and gambling, and uh, was involved in a very costly building project at the time. So they began to bargain for uh, the appropriate price. Leo demanded 12,000 ducats, piously, for the 12 apostles. <laughs> Albert countered with an offer of 7,000 ducats, appropriately, for the seven deadly sins. Well, they finally settled at 10,000 ducats, presumably for the Ten Commandments. I'm not sure on that one. <laughs> they shook hands, but uh, then needed to make another bargain, for Albert did not have the funds that he had promised. So an arrangement was made for Albert to borrow the money that he owed the Pope from the wealthy Fugger financiers, then raise the money to pay the Fuggers back by selling indulgences. And half the money so raised would go to pay back the Fuggers. The other half would go directly to Leo's building project, St. Peter's Basilica in Rome and to make sure that there would be no difficulty selling these indulgences, they were to be very special indulgences. By the way, an indulgence is a, a relaxation of that satisfaction for sin that would be normally required for you to perform to gain forgiveness. So they're kind of, they're just gonna get you, give you a discount what the uh, satisfaction you would need to make to gain forgiveness. Typically, uh, penance required, so this special indulgence, uh, typically penance was required, uh, required of you that you would be contrite, that is, sorry for your sin. Uh, but this requirement was waived on this occasion. No, no need <laughs> on that one. Uh, further, this indulgence could be purchased, and this was thought advantageous by many, could be purchased in advance for a sin you are planning to commit. Uh, so if it was going to be a real wide weekend, you could just get one of these in advance and you would be covered. And uh, finally, one of the most appealing features for their sale, the purchase of this indulgence could free a name departed from the pains of purgatory. Uh, purgatory uh, was a temporary place of torment reserved for those who had not yet made adequate satisfaction for their sins during their lifetime, which would be the vast majority. So it's kind of, you weren't, it's like an outpatient station of hell. It was, it was nasty, but you'd get out of there eventually, eventually. Uh, and you could get out if you bought one of these indulgences. Well, to uh, hawk these indulgences, the services of one Johannes Tetzel, a Dominican preacher was solicited. Now this Tetzel fellow, he was a master salesman, and he knew just how to open a German's purse. Even if you would violate the mother of God, he would say rather crassly, you are safe with this piece of paper. Do you not hear the voices of your dead relatives crying out to you saying, pity us, pity us for we are in dire torment from which you can redeem us for a mere pittance and will you not? And he would end, oh, here's, here is Tetzel. Little fellow putting the coin. 
He would then end with the ditty. As soon as the coin in the coffer rings, the soul from purgatory springs. Well, people flocked to avail themselves of these prize indulgences. And Tetzel made the perverse boast, I have saved more by selling indulgences than Peter ever did by preaching. Now, Frederick the Wise of Saxony, the prince in the territory where uh, Wittenberg uh, resided, forbade the sale of indulgences in his realm. Now, this was not because he thought them particularly scandalous, uh, rather because it interfered with his own business. For Prince Frederick had assembled a collection of 17,443 relics, which if viewed with veneration by a visitor and paying the recommended fee, would gain the visiting viewer precisely 1,902,202 years and 270 days off purgatory. Among the attractions were, in his relic collection, a twig from Moses' burning bush, a bucket of soot from Nebuchadnezzar's fiery furnace, a wisp of straw from the crib of Christ, my personal favorite, a bit of bread eaten at the Last Supper. <laughs> well, how they got that one. Uh, a piece of the left horn of Moses, too. That, that was the, the, the up and running for me. Left horn of Moses. Um, uh, well, and many more relics. Yet, uh, despite Frederick the Wise's... Oh, here he is. Thank you. <laughs> I will embarrass myself if I proceed, I, I, I assure you. I can identify Frederick the Wise, but that's about the extent of my capacities. Well, uh, Frederick the Wise, Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Well, despite Frederick the Wise's prohibition, Wittenbergers would regularly slip across the border to procure their prime pardons, using them as license to sin without compunction. And so Luther would encounter some drunk in the gutter you know, don't worry about me, Pastor. I've got this. And he would brandish his indulgence certificate. Luther's pastoral concern prompted him to take up his pen against Tetzel and his indulgences. Simple folk, he thought, were being deluded into a terrible false security of believing that the wrath of God could be averted, even appeased, by simply paying a fee. Accordingly, Luther drew up 95 theses. There they are. Uh, against indulgences. And on October 31st, 1517, nailed them to the door of the Wittenberg Castle Church. Ever after, this date has been celebrated as Reformation Day all over the world except in America where it's been slightly displaced by another thing, but I can't recall which, but alas. Uh, well, these theses were clear enough for any reader. All those who consider themselves secure in their salvation through letters of indulgence will be eternally damned, and so will their teachers. Although uh, Luther wrote his theses in Latin and intended them as a basis for academic debate, they were translated into German, printed, and distributed throughout the land. And then, soon after, they were translated back from the German into Latin for scholars all over Europe to read them. Well, Tetzel 
the Dominican was uh, awarded by his order a doctoral degree, so he would be able to engage Luther on equal ground. But uh, uh, Tetzel uh, proved not nearly as capable a theologian as he was a salesman. His work had so little weight, Luther dismissed it with the remark that it treated the scriptures, quote, like a sow pushes about a sack of grain. The real formidable opponent in this matter of indulgences was not Tetzel, but rather Jan Eck of Ingolstadt. There he is, the bottom fellow. Those are uh, cartoonist things on the, on, the, on the top, and Eck is one of those also. But it's not as good a resemblance as the real photo down here. Um, so uh, Eck uh, of Ingolstadt, an uh, eminent uh, controversialist, described as having a butcher's face and a bull's voice. Uh, Eck was like a heresy-hunting prize fighter. And in an earlier brief and private encounter, uh, Luther described the experience as a dose of hell. Uh, Eck threw down the gauntlet, and a debate was arranged to be held in Leipzig. On a hot July day in 1519, the two disputants and their supporters packed tightly into the great hall of Duke George the Bearded's castle. Um, all, all of these guys were bearded, uh, but George left it to others to be known as the wise or the steadfast or the magnanimous. He just wanted to go by George the Bearded. Uh, oh well. Uh, well, uh, Eck, Eck let out, you, Luther, challenge indulgences, but popes and church councils uphold the practice. Luther responded, popes can err, as can councils. We must appeal to scripture. Is, uh, there you have the scripture is the weighty thing, and you see monks and popes and all kinds of things there. And I, I couldn't resist. One little student had uh, graffitied in a little demon in the upper one, trying to make the thing go down a little bit further, but unavailingly, clearly. The, the Bible prevails. So, so, uh, uh, so Luther's response, popes can err as can councils. We must appeal to scripture. A simple layman with scripture should be believed, said Luther, over pope or council without it. It was the critical question of authority. And Luther affirmed against Rome the supreme and unchallengeable authority of scripture. <clears throat> Here we have him. There's Luther. Uh, holding up the scripture in opposition. <clears throat> it was <clears throat> this issue of authority that was at the center of the Diet of Worms. Uh, it has nothing to do with what you eat. It was just a place that you met. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, where Luther was summoned by Emperor Charles V to be tried for heresy. Here is Charles V. Luther knew that in all likelihood he would face the flames. Indeed, it was remarkable that he had not already burned for his bold challenge to Rome. But there were not a few who thought him hero, not heretic. As he walked to Worms, the streets were lined with cheering people. And at Worms, 2,000 swarmed to greet him. The experience he dubbed, My Palm Sunday. At the trial, oh, here's, at the trial, no debate or defense was permitted. He was led into a large hall where there lay a huge pile of books. Are these yours? asked the inquisitor. They are my offspring, responded Luther. Then under his breath, he muttered, actually, I wrote more. Charles V was shocked that one man could write so much as it was. And, uh, recant, for they have been condemned. Luther asked for 24 hours. That 
night, doubts assailed him. It seemed all Christendom was against him. Can I alone be right? Am I alone wise? Perhaps the emperor was right. Surely this is madness and monkish habit. One man cannot be right against all Christendom. The next day, Luther was not brought on until nightfall. Candlelight cast a sense of sanctity upon the great hall, crowded with church dignitaries. Recant. Save yourself. Then came the now immortal words. My conscience is captive to the word of God. I can do no other. God help me. Here I stand. He was led out to whispers of, to the flames, to the flames. When he got back to his cell, he threw up his hands. I made it. I made it. I was faithful. Despite his own expectation and that of virtually all others, Luther did not burn. That night, all over Worms, placards appeared bearing the sign of the Bundeshoe. That is the dreaded symbol of peasant revolt. Burn Luther and we rise. It seems Luther had become a bit of a folk hero. There he is presented as the German Hercules. And so Luther was released. But while making his way back to Wittenberg, he was fallen upon by armed horsemen who carried him off. Uh, as it turned out, those kidnappers were actually friends, and they secretly stashed their hero in the castle of the Wartburg for his safekeeping. The Wartburg Castle, Luther called his Patmos. Even in hiding, he was for safety to assume a disguise. So he grew a beard, donned knight's armor, and went by the name of Knight George, or Junker Georg, George the Dragon Slayer. And uh, there he abode in a room with a retractable staircase for 10 months. Quarantined, Luther was restless. He wrote to his Wittenberg University colleague Melanchthon, already eight days have passed in which I have written nothing. But Luther would soon make up for the loss. His Wartburg exile would be among the most productive months of his life. Before they had ended, he had written a dozen books and translated the entire New Testament into German. This feat he accomplished in a mere 11 weeks. He worked at a rate of over 1,500 words a day, like a man possessed. He would later add the Old Testament, completing the whole Bible. It was one of his greatest gifts to the German people, and a marvelous piece of literature, which secured a place in the hearts of all and did much to create the modern German language. Well, not long after Luther's friendly incarceration, some travelers came upon a knight. The talk of the day was the whereabouts of Luther. The great bearded knight <coughs> uttered with confidence, he will soon be in Wittenberg. How should he know, wondered the wayfarers. Then they noticed the knight was reading a book. An odd thing for a knight, especially at closer glance, which revealed the book to be a Hebrew Old Testament. It was Luther, and he was on his way home. Back at Wittenberg, few recognized the bearded knight. Even some of his closest friends could not penetrate the disguise. And for a little fun, Melanchthon invited their close companion, Lucas Cranach, a famous artist, to do a portrait of a famous visiting knight. It was Luther sitting. But even the eye of an artist failed to discern the identity until it was finally revealed with a good laugh. 
Well, for all their fun, the situation in Wittenberg was urgent. And Luther had been called back by his younger colleague, Philip Melanchthon, sending up a May Day. Some changes. Clearing out some of the churches here. Uh, several of the more enthusiastic of Luther's followers were enacting changes at a rate that left many in his congregation dizzied. Relics were removed, candles were confiscated, pastors preached in plain clothing, and the Roman Mass was changed to a simple supper celebration. It was not that Luther judged all of these measures wrong. He simply thought the rate of their implementation wrong. You have gone altogether too fast. We must first win the hearts of the people by preaching. Accordingly, Luther mounted the pulpit and then, like a uniformed police officer, ordered the chaos of the traffic through a flurry of orchestrated gestures, commands, and whistles. Here he is. He preached daily on the topic of law and gospel, and by this means succeeded in restoring order. For this feat, Luther would take no credit. I did nothing. The word did everything. I simply taught and preached, and while I slept or drank Wittenberg beer with Melanchthon and my friends, the word did everything. Yes, the word did everything. But we err to think Luther idle. From his return to Wittenberg, he wrote one treatise every fortnight for the rest of his life. He kept three printing presses running without interruption for the next 25 years. Once Luther was giving a tour of his town, and uh, they walked past a huge and lovely home. Oh, what's this? Luther said, oh, I built that. It was the house of his printer. He didn't get any money for any of his books. Well, amidst all of Luther's uh, work, his practice is rather challenging. I find I have so much work to do, I must pray one hour a day to get it all accomplished. Sometimes I am so overwhelmed with work, I find I must pray two hours. Among his most significant works were those that affirmed the priesthood of all believers. All Christians have access to God and are not dependent upon a mediatorial priestly class. We may all minister to one another according to our callings. And also that of Christian vocation. We need not become a monk or a nun to please God. We may please him in whatever place in life he calls us. As Luther put it, you may pitch hay to the glory of God if you do it in faith and obedience. Well, any account of Luther would be incomplete without mention of Katie. Luther writes in 1525, when occupied with other things, God suddenly plunged me into marriage. It seems several nuns had taken to heart Luther's teaching on vocation. If we don't need to be nuns to please God, uh, I'm not inclined to stay here, uh, indeed. Uh, but it was no easy thing to skip a convent in that day. In fact, it was a capital offense to even abet a <coughs> nun's escape. But 12 did manage to abscond, concealing themselves in empty herring and pickle barrels. And nine of them headed for Wittenberg, the source of this new teaching. Upon their arrival, the town crier announced with some alarm, a wagon load of vestal virgins has rolled into town. Lord, give them husbands before worse befall. <laughs> uh, many of Luther's students and colleagues volunteered happily to meet the need and were all happily matched. All that is, 
except one, a feisty redhead, Katharina von Bora. There she is, obviously a very discriminating eye there. <laughs> she proved challengingly picky, but hinted that she just might consider Dr. Luther. Uh, Luther was initially disinclined, but finally swayed by three inducements. Well, it would please my parents, and it would spite the Pope. <laughs> and since the Lord is likely to return any minute now, I might never get the chance again. <laughs> well, they were very happily married. Soon, Luther would write, Next to God's word, there is no more precious treasure than Christian marriage. God's highest gift on earth is a pious, cheerful, God-fearing, home-keeping wife. Lucas Crana. Uh, the, uh, the famous uh, painter, painted their portraits for a wedding gift on their wedding day. Talk about holding up the reception because of pictures. I mean, if they're painting, <laughs> that's probably going to be a long way. Uh, and uh, Elector, Elector John gave them uh, the empty black cloister as a wedding present. Uh, here that is. There was their first home. Um, and uh, great wedding present. Look at that. Uh, and uh, Katie, uh, a very hard worker, soon had whipped their home into new shape. Uh, she discovered that the straw in Luther's bed was just horrifically molded, just a heap of putrescence. He had not changed the straw for over a year. Uh, Luther began to notice uh, new things uh, appearing, like lace curtains, there, uh, there's a lot to get used to in the first year of marriage, the newlywed opined. One wakes up in the morning and finds a pair of pigtails on the pillow that were not there before. <laughs> or my personal favorite. In domestic affairs, I defer to Katie. Otherwise, I'm led by the Holy Spirit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, domestic affairs included planting fields for Katie, caring for an orchard, harvesting the fish pond, looking after the barnyard animals, indeed slaughtering livestock, and brewing her own beer. Uh, quite remarkable, hold it. Uh, occasionally, Luther forgot that he was no longer a monk. Uh, once he stayed in his tower study for three days, engrossed in a project. Uh, there he is in his study. Like the new Jerome, because there's a little lie in there suggesting that uh, but that's Luther. Uh, well, Katie would have none of this. Uh, she brought in a, a, a laborer and had the door permanently removed of his study to exclude any occurrence of that again. Uh, Katie did her husband a world of spiritual good, for he would often suffer from severe depression, sitting catatonic and taciturn for days. Whenever such occurred, Katie would quietly change into all black attire, as if in mourning, when eventually Luther would notice and grunt, who died? She would respond, I judged from your demeanor that God had died. <laughs> this technique never failed to snap him out of his doldrums. I would not trade her for all the gold in Venice, he said. And he paid her the highest tribute when he called Paul's epistle to the Galatians, my Katharina von Bora. Indeed, he began to be a trifle worried over his devotion. I give more credit to Katharina than to Christ, who really has done a whole lot more for me than her. For all his praise, uh, Luther was yet able to give uh, Katie constructive admonitions. It seems he thought her a trifle too quick to speak and slow to ponder, 
for he prescribed that she recites to herself silently the Lord's Prayer each time before opening her mouth. A more appreciated arrangement for Katie was the means by which her husband prodded her to read the Bible. He paid her to do it <coughs> and promised the handsome sum of 50 golden if she could finish the whole Bible by Easter. Eventually she balked. I've read enough. I've heard enough. I know enough. Would to God I lived it. <laughs> this uh, great theologian was also a tender father. They had six children. My Katarina is fulfilling Genesis 128, is how he announced their births. Be fruitful and multiply. And so, if I had time, then I certainly commend it. Uh, wonderful father. Uh, some of the letters that he write, writes to his uh, children are marvelous. Don't have time to go through them now, but I commend them to you. Uh, with Luther's clear presentation of the gospel and his translation of the Bible for the German people, his modeling of Christian family life was perhaps his greatest legacy. In Luther, God raised up a man who gave biblical answers to vital questions which had been long muddled and answered amiss. How may one be right before God? Not by works, but by grace alone. Christ alone. Sola gratia. Sola Christus. Second, what is the Christian's authority? Not hope or church or reason, but God's word, the Bible. Sola Scriptura. How may we please God? No royal road of monastery. Rather by a life of faith. Wherever God calls us. Sola fiducia. Exclusively through faith. These were the great Reformation watchwords. A little ball here, but uh, it's called the tree of faith. All that grows up out of the roots of the gospel and spreads. In 1546, old and weak, Luther heard of a sad quarrel between two old friends in the village of his birth. He made the long journey on foot to reconcile them. This he achieved, but it was to be his last service. He caught cold on the journey and died in the village of his birth. The few around him at the last heard him faintly repeat three times, John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Then fell the final silence. The verse summarized the gospel for which he had stood so valiantly. As the family shield that he adopted proclaimed in symbol, here it is. It's a black cross on a white heart surrounded by a red rose. Christ cursed for us the black cross makes clean the heart, the white heart, and brings joy forever, the red rose. When news reached Wittenberg, Wittenberg, his friend and colleague Philip Melanchthon was in the middle of a lecture. Out of stunned silence, he finally in faltering voice told his students, then broke out into the cry, the chariot of Israel and its horsemen. Another great Elijah had gone to his reward. As Mrs. Luther said, And who would not be sad and afflicted at the loss of such a precious man as my dear Lord was? He did great things, not just for a city or a single land, but for the whole world. And Katie herself, 
She lived another four years keeping the cloister and raising the children, dying in her 51st year. Her last words attest that she too had clung to the gospel her husband had preached. I will stick to Christ like a burr to a top coat. Amen.